I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have some topics today that I don't know that they're so good for us to learn about. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes a medicine can be a little hard to swallow, but you need to take it, right? So exactly. today <laughs> we're going to try to give you some good medicine, um, even though some of the news may not be the best that we want to hear. Um, but we are excited to have you all with us today. Um, you can interact with us via the chat function in Zoom, or if you're on Facebook Live, you can interact with us in the comment section. And you can always reach us at ukforestry.org. But today, Renee, we've got our resident entomologist. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're going to start claiming Dr. Lars. We are. We he, are. he is a, a good friend of the show and he brings us a lot of great content, mm -hmm. but he's going to be talking about a couple of insects that we really need to be paying attention to. Um, some of you all may have heard about the spotted lanternfly and another one, um, spongy moth, which actually used to be gypsy moth. So um, Dr. Lars will be telling us all about those. And then we've got Dr. Crocker with us. She's got a couple of segments, one on pesky plants and one on a citizen science project where she's looking for some help. So I'm really excited about today's show. Glad you all could be with us and I'm looking forward to it, Renee. Definitely. So let's go ahead and get started. So Dr. Larson, if you want to go ahead and turn. Hi, hey. welcome to the show. Welcome. Thanks welcome. for having me again. Uh, yeah. uh, you're always welcome here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like we're going to be having a, a nice citizen science focused day today. I'm going to be talking about our citizen science project that's focused on the, the two invasives that you alluded to. Mm -hmm. and try and go through some of the history of those pests as well. You want me to go ahead and get yeah. Dr. Yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. You know, it sounds right. like these aren't pests that we want here. In yeah. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, they are unfortunately ones though that are kind of on our doorstep. So uh, what I wanted to talk about is just uh, the Slow the Spread program that's been used to monitor and help to reduce problems that we see with the spongy moth, which you can see the caterpillar up there on the left. Uh, how we're going to be adapting that project for some citizen science here in Kentucky, and how we're actually going to try and adapt it even further to use against another invasive species, that spotted lanternfly, which you see on the right there. Both very eye-catching looking organisms, I think, but both unfortunately destructive and unwanted here in Kentucky. I did want to start just kind of like a, with a, a brief primer on invasive species. I know that this is a topic that comes up here on From the Woods today a lot, and that maybe a lot of you are concerned with, uh, but I did want to try and apply a strict definition for us here for our discussions today. Uh, an invasive species is any animal or plant from one region of the world that is then brought to a new region and doesn't belong in that new environment. They have some traits that help them to become established and then become truly invasive. Uh, they're usually able to adapt quickly to their new environment and take advantage of empty niches, or outcompete anything that uh, actually is already in that niche, and that's by their reproduction. They typically reproduce very quickly compared to native species in the area. It's not because of any special traits or that they do this in their native range. It's because when they're introduced to this new spot, they likely don't have anything that focuses on eating them or laying their eggs on them. And so any kids that they have are very likely to survive. So they start outstripping the reproductive capabilities of the native species. And ultimately they harm the property, the economy or native organisms in their introduced habitat. These first two things that I mentioned kind of lead to that. Uh, you can see a smattering of invasive and potentially invasive species here at the bottom of your screen. In the left corner, we've got the fire ant, the imported fire ant. In the center, we have the Asian longhorn tick. And then on the right, we have the Asian giant hornet, which is more famously known as the murder hornet. And all of these are in various stages of their invasion. For fire ants, they are very well established here in the United States. They've been here for quite some time. Uh, they're expanding up into states like Kentucky as well. Then the Asian longhorn tick in the center there, it's one that's present in the country, it's been found in the state, and we're dealing with more and more possible outbreaks of it. And then the Asian giant hornet that we see on the right there, it's, it is sort of invasive, it's introduced, um, it's not fully got a toehold in the United States as far as we know, it's not here in this state, but it is something that we have to keep our eye on as it becomes more and more of an invasive species. 
Uh, there are lots of famous examples that are already in the state, things that we've talked about on this show before, things like Japanese beetle, emerald ash borer, brown marmorated stink bug across the top there. I do want to like push back a little bit. Everybody seems to think of invasive species as solely being bugs, or there's always a lot of insect focus. But, you know, we've got mussels like the zebra mussel there on the left in the bottom row. Uh, we've got plants. Kudzu is a great example. Bush honeysuckle is another. Uh, things that people sometimes like, like honeysuckle, but is uh, something that moves in and takes over an area. So we've already got some that live here. Some of the ones that I'm going to talk about today are more of the wolves on our border, the things that don't live in the state, but could here in the near future. I also wanted to make an important distinction between uh, in terms that we use when discussing these. So we have invasive species, and then we have non-native species, which comes up a lot, I think, in discussions with forestry and with people in general talking about landscapes and woods and places like that. Uh, we do have lots of non-native organisms that live here on the North American continent. There are some insect and insect adjacent things in the first row there. Uh, the European honeybee is a great example. This is something that we brought with us here uh, as Europeans that colonized this continent and took over. Uh, that was an insect that we imported with us and we would release so that we could have it. And it's very hard, I think, to tell somebody that it's an invasive species. Uh, most people wouldn't want to hear that because we love honeybees, but there, are, there have been documented pieces of information about how they've harmed native pollinator populations. So technically speaking, you could make the case, uh, but it's something that we rely on so much that we really don't push too hard against it. Uh, the night crawler there in the center top row, that's another example of something that was accidentally brought here and released. It's not native, but it was able to find empty earthworm niches here. There weren't always earthworms in different states or in different parts of this continent due to glaciation. And so it was able to move in and take over. And now we kind of rely on it for soil health. Um, the Chinese mantis on the right here is another non-native, not labeled as invasive. Uh, we have other famous examples, the, the pheasant that we see down there, Russian sage, uh, a beautiful plant that pollinators love that can often be found in urban and suburban landscapes. It's not considered invasive because it tends to stay contained there, but it is non-native, uh, which confronts some people who want to have native-only landscapes. There's another one that I like to highlight, the Kentucky bluegrass plant that you see on the bottom right there. Uh, it's not from here, despite the fact that we call ourselves the bluegrass state, that it has our state name in it, it's a Eurasian species that was modified here. So there's lots of this happening. Uh, it's a very difficult situation, I think, to simplify and parse through. Uh, it's not always as black and white as invasive and non-invasive though. So I just kind of wanted to make that distinction as we got started. These are predominantly moved into new areas now through globalized trade and travel where we have things like ballast water or packing materials that will bring new invasive species from other continents to ours. And then once they're introduced here, we see them moved around quite a bit by firewood uh, and the vehicles that we drive. Uh, things like trucks that go across state lines, they often pick up invasives and accidentally transport them from one state to a next. So we're kind of our, our, our own worst enemy with all of this. We tend to help these organisms out quite a bit as they invade. So that means that we can't be worried about the ones that already live here, those already present invasive species, things like the Japanese beetle and the emerald ash borer. Uh, you know, they eat up a lot of bandwidth for talking about insects and talking about invasive species. But for me, as an extension professional and as somebody that talks to a lot of, of different people across the state, I worry and I try to teach people about the wolves at our door, these invasive species that aren't here. Uh, and then I think unfortunately become out of sight, out of mind, but really need to be at the forefront of our mind. We need to be thinking about these bugs pretty consistently because if they do arrive here, it will change the lives of everybody that lives in this state. Uh, not just people who work with wood products or who enjoy being outside, uh, there's going to be lots and lots of impacts. So we have to have programs that are focused on these that monitor for them, which is one of those hard things to justify, right? Uh, you're trying to prove a negative. We have this program and it's prevented this pest from coming in. And then people start to think, well, maybe we don't need this program anymore because we don't deal with this pest. Uh, it's not something that's really confronting us. So we need those kinds of things to be around. 
And I think that they have been very helpful and been very successful. Uh, and Kentucky is, a, a, I think, a state that should pride itself uh, because it's had very long-standing success with monitoring and tracking pests like the spongy moth that we're going to focus on here today. Uh, so the ones that we see highlighted here, we got the spotted lanternfly, which could come from Indiana. We have the Asian longhorn beetle, which could come from Ohio, and then the spongy moths, which could potentially come from the Virginia area. The spongy moth I do want to talk about here up front, and the first thing I want to address is the name spongy moth. Some of you may be hearing it for the first time. Some of you may be slightly confused upon hearing that nomenclature. It is the new common name for the species Lymantria dispar. This was formerly known as the gypsy moth. Uh, I'm not going to be using that name today except for this slide to make the explanation. Spongy moth was selected by the Entomological Society of America in 2022 as the new name for this species. This just happened back in March. Uh, in 2021, they decided to get rid of the old common name. This was done after some really in-depth discussions with groups of people from the Romani people. Uh, they were pointing out how this is a slur to them and that it's being applied to an invasive species that we have eradication campaigns for, which makes them feel a little targeted because in their history, they have had eradication campaigns waged against them as humans. And so it's all sort of mixed together and created a very nasty situation uh, and using terms that, we, that are outdated and shouldn't be used anymore. So the Entomology Society decided to change it and spongy moth was selected based on the name of this pest in areas where they speak French. Uh, it's called the spongeuse moth. I don't speak French very well. That will become apparent in the slides here today because I'm going to be talking about France quite a bit. Uh, but that, that name is applied there uh, based on the egg masses that they make. And so that was why it was adapted for this situation. So that's the pest that we're talking about. You may know it by a different name in the past. This insect is historically uh, one of North America's most important invasive species. Since 1921, it is estimated that they've defoliated nearly 81 million acres of forest here in our, in our, in our country, on our continent. Uh, it is also considered a historic pest because they are the species that are most responsible for government-sponsored eradication campaigns and government-sponsored monitoring programs. Uh, this is the one that really spurred that on in the late 1800s because of the damage that they were generating. So it's truly an important insect uh, in the history of my science and in the history of things like the USDA and other groups that, that help to deal with these invasive pests. This is the part that I'm most excited to share about today, uh, but I'm also worried will be the most boring perhaps to some of you that are tuning in. Uh, but to me, this it's a fascinating story, okay? So if you'll indulge me, I wanted to share about how this insect got to the United States because it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird story. Uh, the spongy moth is an invasive species that we know fairly certainly was introduced to the United States in 1868. They were purposefully imported. This was not an accidental introduction like we talk about with most invasives. They were purposely brought here by a scientist whose name is Etienne Leopold Truvelo. He was a gentleman that was attempting to create an American silk empire. He knew that he, he knows that silk comes from insects. Uh, he has a key interest in making silk in his home of Medford, Massachusetts, which you see there on the right. That's his house uh, back in the day. And he wanted to do this because we we're talking about the Civil War era here and there wasn't cotton coming from the South. So he saw an opportunity to produce silk and then sell it to garment factories in the north where he lived and to make a lot of money potentially. He is a scientist. This is the only known photograph of him on the left here. Very dapper looking gentleman, right? That's a dope beard, I think. Looks really fancy, nice bow tie. Um, he in, in of himself is kind of a fascinating character. He's a French immigrant as his name implies. He may have been banished from France. It's unknown exactly what spurred him to leave his native country, but there is speculation that uh, it was a political exile. He was a Republican, uh, and I don't mean that in the sense of American politics. He believed in the French Republic, and at the time that he left, the French monarchy and the French empire was coming back into vogue with, I think it's Napoleon III, 
and that he was perhaps asked to leave France because of his political leanings. He believed in democracy and voting and having France stand as a republic. Uh, so he has an interesting backstory. Upon arriving in the United States, he is a, a great artist. He is very famous for his drawings that he can produce. He works as a cartographer for some time. Uh, he's an autodidact. He is somebody who is self-taught in many things. And he becomes interested in entomology. He lives near Harvard. And so he becomes integrated with the naturalist community there. And he begins to focus on moths. Uh, he's very keen on this moth, the polyphemus moth. Beautiful native insect, as you see here, one of our larger moth species with those bold striking eyes on the back. They do produce a silken cocoon around their pupa, as you see on the right. And he was convinced that he could take this insect and create an American silk moth, uh, very similar to the traditional silk moth that we see from China, and that he could spin the silk out of these cocoons and then sell it to people. He raised a million caterpillars at his home every year of this species. He fenced in most of his yard with a big bug net, basically, and he created this, this big sock around a lot of his property, which was covered in oaks, and he raised his caterpillars in there. Uh, his neighbors often reported that they could see him in there taking a club and trying to kill birds that were breaking in to eat his caterpillars. So I just want you to imagine that you had like a French neighbor that was cursing in the middle of the night and clubbing birds to death as he raised a million caterpillars next to you every year. Uh, and that's the kind of guy that we're talking about. He's an entomologist, so he's a little weird. Uh, but he was very convinced that this was the key to success and money and fame. Uh, it didn't work, though, in the long term. The silk that comes from that polyphemus moth is not of high quality. It's not something that he could sell. So he's turning around in his brain, trying to figure out what he's going to do. And in 1867, he went back home to France, to his native land. And this was explicitly to acquire a new moth that he could use for silk. And he was going to bring it with him back to America. And this, it raises no red flags in his time, right? Because as I mentioned with the honeybee, this is something that, that was just happening. Uh, white Europeans were very into this idea of bringing species from the old world, quote unquote, to the new world and releasing them. They didn't see an ethical problem with this. They didn't see any environmental problems with this. So he's fully on board with this. He's going to go home. He's going to get a bug and bring it with him. Now, there is some debate about what exactly he was up to. Some people think he intentionally sought out the spongy moth and brought it home with him. Others believe that he was actually after this moth. It's called the Tencent silk moth that you see on the right here. Uh, it was imported to Europe in what I think should be a case of forewarning to, uh, to Tuvalo. It was brought to Europe by a baron who bought it from Japan and he released it on his vineyard area. And in about 10 years, it killed all his oak trees. And so he kind of abandoned the project. Uh, so it had become a local pest in Europe, but it was known for making high quality silk, Tencent silk. Uh, Truvelo had a best buddy whose name is Felix Edward Guerin Minville, and he had identified and named this moth in, in Europe, and he was going to buy some of these moths off of Felix and take them home. Now, he either wanted that so that he could produce the silk that he could sell. You can see the pupil case of the Tencent moth there on the left. Looks very similar to the actual silk moth that we see on the right. Uh, so you could see where maybe there was some possibility where the, the product could be the same. There's other people who believe that he wanted the spongy moth, though, and that he was going to bring it with him. And at the time, the spongy moth was in the same genus as the traditional silk moth of China. Uh, new evidence that comes later shows that they're not related really at all. But he thought he could crossbreed them, is what these people argue. He was famous for attempting to crossbreed moths. And some people think he was trying to breed the spongy moth with the silk moth to make this really hardy strain. Regardless of what he was really up to, by 1868, he had bought them uh, and he had eggs of the spongy moth. And then he set out to rear them on his property. And he lost control of them basically immediately. Uh, the moths that he, or the, the eggs that he acquired, the caterpillars hatched. And some stories, apocryphally, there's a storm that comes in and it tears a net off of a tree that he has them contained in, and that's how they get out. It's much, much more likely, though, that he attempted to rear these in the same way that he had done the polyphemus moth for a decade. And the moths or the caterpillars have a distinct size difference, and they just simply 
got out. They just simply walked out of his net. Uh, there are anecdotes of his neighbors reporting in 1868 that they remember him being out in his yard multiple nights in a row with a lamp trying to find them. Uh, and then by 1869, they're considered kind of loose. They're just in Medford, Massachusetts, where he lives. Uh, he tries to report this to the authorities and let people know what happened, but nobody really pays a lot of attention and it gets to the point where it's going to become an issue. Uh, the, throughout the 1870s, nobody pays a lot of attention to the insect. They don't appear in any surveys. There's no interest in them. Truvelo, for his part, after this, he gives up entomology and becomes an astronomer. Uh, he becomes very famous for his drawings of different planets and astronomical uh, phenomena. This is his version of Saturn and Jupiter here. His version of Jupiter actually appeared in an episode of Star Trek, The Original Adventures. Uh, I just like throwing that in there. But uh, he actually becomes very famous in his new science and gets admitted to the Academy of Arts and Sciences here in America. Uh, then we start to see problems. In, 18, in the 1880s, Medford, Massachusetts experienced these huge outbreaks of spongy moth caterpillars. The contemporary literature reports that residents were going out and drowning them in water or picking them up and putting them in kerosene and burning big piles of them. Uh, they were often found on trees along roads, which you see on the left here, and they were heavily associated with firewood. It is thought that they originally escaped his property because somebody bought one of his sheds and then they moved it across town. And so they actually helped to strew some of these caterpillars through the city. After a mild winter in 1888 into 1889, there was an explosion of spongy moth. They basically took over the, the town and they started taking over Massachusetts. Uh, they were covered in caterpillars. It was a living black wave that crashed through towns eating everything. And we see these dedicated campaigns for people to go out and try to pick them off of trees to treat with various products at the time. Uh, there were also people that were using fire to try and treat them. You're seeing sort of the advent of a blowtorch here or uh, a, a, a different, uh, what's it called in war, uh, the jet pack with fire, that, that's what we're seeing here. Uh, so in 1890, there's the formation of the first government sponsored eradication campaign focused on an invasive species. This is a very historic moment for economic entomology. It's pretty much the basis for invasive response to, to today. Uh, this is how we tend to react to things. And all of that is to say that we have been trying to fight this pest for a long time. They didn't eradicate it back then. And since that happened, we have to deal with it today. So it's part of a group of moths that include other hairy looking caterpillars. I don't wanna belabor the biology of it too much, but suffice to say here, we'll look at some eggs. They lay their eggs on multiple different things. The eggs are what help to propel invasions. They can get on cars, as you see on the right, uh, firewood, lots of different things. And this is what gives them the, the spongy name is this kind of meshy looking yellow tan fuzzy egg mass that they produce. So that's one thing. The caterpillar is another. They're the ones that actually cause the damage. They are about two inches long right before they pupate. They have red and blue dots on their back. Uh, they feed on lots and lots of leaf material. Their favorite is oaks. Uh, I just wanna show some of the damage that they produce here. They will chew holes in leaves when they're young, then they will completely defoliate the tree. There can be twig dieback with this. The tree tries to produce a new flush of leaves, but ultimately they struggle. Uh, in multiple outbreak years, uh, this can lead to possible tree mortality, but usually the tree is able to recover. But it's not a pretty sight to have all of this defoliation going on. We do have some insects here in Kentucky that get confused with the spongy moth, uh, the eastern tent caterpillar and the fall webworm. Both of these produce silk hiding areas that they live in. The spongy moth doesn't do this though. They don't make these hidey areas like we see these nests on the right and left. Uh, so that's an easy way to separate these pests from the invasive. They do feed on over 300 species. Uh, like I said, doesn't always kill the tree, but it does stress them out. We would be prime habitat for them in Kentucky. Uh, if you look at this forest type group map from the USDA, from the Forest Service, it shows how we have an oak, hickory, pine, forest in eastern Kentucky that would be prime habitat for this pest and it would confront a lot of our uh, jobs and revenue in the state. Ten billion dollars in annual revenue for forestry products, 53,000 jobs tied up in this state. 
uh, these would be under threat. Uh, some of these products wouldn't be able to be shipped anymore. They would be quarantined. Uh, it would have impacts on everybody though. They poop everywhere. It rains down in outbreak years and becomes very disgusting. The caterpillars fall down people's shirts and you can see what they do on the right there. They cause these rashes on people. They don't have venomous hairs like we see with other caterpillars, but they are very irritating. Uh, so I don't know what Truvilla was up to when he was importing this moth. Uh, it just seems crazy to think that this irritating, aggressive moth would be of any value to him. But the Slow the Spread program has been combating this insect for a couple of decades at this point. They have helped to slow it down. This is one of our slower pests. You can see that with Slow the Spread, uh, we have been able to contain it in mostly the New England and Mid-Atlantic states. It has gotten up into the Great Lakes as well. Without the Slow the Spread project, it's projected that Kentucky would already have a breeding population within the next couple of years. So these group, this group has helped to protect about 100 million acres of forest and reduce the spread by 60%. And we are adapting this into a citizen science project. Uh, it's gonna focus on monitoring for the pest. The Slow the Spread program in total includes the use of pheromone traps and burlap banding like we see here as well as microbial control, where they spray a product from the air that kills the caterpillars, we're gonna be focused on the pheromone trap part. That's because we're, battle, we're a battleground state. Uh, this is somewhere that isn't fully invaded. We have no breeding populations here, but we need to be monitoring for it to make sure that it doesn't get here from places like Indiana, Ohio, or either West or regular old Virginia. Uh, there have been two infestations in two problem areas in Kentucky. Jefferson County in 1985, Carroll County in 1994, Fleming and Campbell counties, uh, Fleming County in 1994 and Campbell County in 07. All of these have been defeated through the Slow the Spread program. So what we're doing is uh, teaming up with the Office of the State Entomologist to turn this into a citizen science project where we're working with extension agents across the state who have volunteers that will be hanging up these pheromone traps. Uh, in 2021, these are the areas of the state that received pheromone traps through the official Slow the Spread program. In 2022, this is the proposed area, or these. this is the area that they ended up putting traps in. All of those little tiny triangles that you see are traps that have been set up by the Office of the State Entomologist. And if we look a little closer, we can see these bigger triangles, yellow triangles, those are our traps for our volunteers. There's 90 of them set up right now. Uh, they are augmenting the slow the spread effort. They're monitoring in counties that we didn't have traps in previously, as well as building up a higher number in counties that we already had the traps in. Uh, the traps are, I think, interesting looking. They're kind of a diamond shape, uh, kind of a triangle shape. They're green or orange typically, and they're gonna be hanging up. Some of you may have seen them before. Our friends in the office of the state entomologist report to me that uh, they have seen the traps uh, destroyed, cut down, sometimes blasted with shotguns uh, for target practice. So if you see these traps, please don't bother them. Please don't mess with them. Know that they're there to help us monitor for a really problematic insect. And if you're interested in being a part of this citizen science effort, we are looking at spongy moth. We're also looking at spotted lanternfly and its preferred host, the tree of heaven. Our project isn't fully open to the public. If you're really, really, really interested, get a hold of me at my email, jonathan.larson at uky.edu, and we can maybe work something out. Um, but in the future, this is our pilot year. We're hoping that we can turn this into something uh, that we can offer across the state. If you really want to contribute, uh, but you don't necessarily want to jump through any hoops that I may present. You can also make reports like this through the app iNaturalist, which we can also monitor uh, for some of these invasive tests. I think I went a little over my time, and I apologize, uh, Renee and You're Billy. Fine. But uh, that, that's kind of what we're doing. That's kind of why we're doing it. Uh, I got a little excited to talk about Truvalo, I think, and I almost took up too much of your time. It was very interesting. Who it's knew? It's a crazy that, guy, right? Yeah. We've had him around that long. I, did, I didn't realize that it's been that long. Yeah, it's, that's one of the interesting things about that pest, I think, is with a lot of invasives, it seems like it gets here, and then 20 years later, it's everywhere, right? Emerald ash borer is in more than half the United States. But right. with the spongy moth, they really have been able to slow it down almost to this natural spread. We're helped by the fact that the females of that species can't fly. 
Uh, we're very lucky in that regard, but uh, but we have helped. We have seen that the slow the spread program works, and so that's why we want to want to expose more people to it. Because what you tell somebody about, they may not believe, but when they do it themselves as part of a citizen science project, then they understand the value of these these management tools and they value those those programs. So maybe they're more willing to invest in the in the future. You know, Jonathan, I would say anybody that cares about Kentucky woodlands should care about these programs, right? And should be involved. Yeah, I mean, we it, some of those maps you should, scared me, right? They were <laughs> scary to think yeah. that, you know, um, uh, how devastating that could be to our forests here in Kentucky and to all those who depend on those forests. So this is something we should all be able to rally around and try to support. So I would encourage all of our viewers to try to contribute where they can as appropriate to this effort and um, get others on board with it as well. So no more shooting the traps. Okay, please. Please. Yeah. <laughs> those up. Yeah, we need yeah. those. Yeah. Get some skeets. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jonathan, I know the topics may not be, you know, as far as like um, fun, but they're so important in what you're doing. And so I can't thank you enough, really, on behalf of everybody who loves Kentucky's woodlands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We yes. appreciate hearing that. Uh, yes. Thank you for having us on to talk about it. Anytime. Yes, indeed. Yeah, okay. we'll have you back. Maybe the next time. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Wow. That, that was really interesting, Renee. It was. Like I said, a little scary, though, too, because, you know, That's you what I said at the beginning. <laughs> you're like, oh, oh, no. Not another pest. I know, I know. But we have to stay vigilant and we have to keep on the lookout, you know, and there's always something around the corner. And, you know, that's one of the things we try to do on From the Woods today is keep you informed of what's going on so that you can make good, informed decisions out there about your woodlands and helping those who depend on woodlands. Definitely. And, you know, I, I think I've mentioned this a couple of times on our show, but, you know, I know we hear a lot of uh, bugs that we've gotten from Asia or what have you, you know, and I think I'm going to try to get Dr. Crocker and maybe Dr. Larson to do what we've given them. You know, yes. <laughs> you know I think a black locust, you know, one of our native trees here is kind of a, a problem in overseas and China and other places as well. So, yeah, it goes both ways. But it yeah, goes both ways. But I think a lot of people don't realize that they're they just don't. like, oh, we've gotten all this stuff. But I I think we've given we've given yes. our share as well well that's one thing about global trade it allows the facilitation of movement of a lot of stuff whether we intend it or not so um, right. yeah, so we got to be vigilant again so, exactly you know speaking of things that kind of bug us <laughs> i know i was just thinking of that you know we have a new edition of our pesky plants with dr ellen crocker yeah, and Dr. Crocker's um, put together this nice video. Dr. Crocker couldn't be with us today. She's actually out doing some of that work that Jonathan was talking about there earlier. So um, thanks to Dr. Crocker for her efforts to try to keep our woodlands healthy as well. But uh, without any further ado, Renee, I'll go ahead and get it started. All right, sounds great. Our pesky plant this week is Japanese honeysuckle, an invasive plant that you don't want to see in your woods um, or in your landscape setting. So it's really distinctive right now when it's flowering. It tends to flower late May to early June. And while it's flowering, not only does it have these um, beautiful flowers, but they're also very fragrant. And you might have seen this and thought, I love this plant, but don't be deceived. Um, Japanese honeysuckle can take over and cause problems um, in your woods as well as in other settings. So here's some things that it's doing. You can see it kind of completely carpeting areas, growing over shrubs into trees, carpeting the ground. And that's one of the reasons it's a problem is that it moves into natural areas and um, will kind of mat over things. And, um, you know, it can be a problem when it does this because it's going to be reducing the diversity of native plant species you want to see, and it can also impact your trees and regeneration of seedlings. So it really prefers these highlight full sun settings. Um, here you can see it growing there, but uh, one of the problems with Japanese honeysuckle is that it can also tolerate shade. So it might sit around in a shady spot, just waiting for the right conditions, maybe a tree falls, or you have a harvest, or um, you have some disturbance there that will let it take off. Um, so while it prefers the sun, um, it can tolerate other settings. 
And um, in addition to kind of carpeting things and growing over them, it can climb up and into trees. So here you see some stems, some smaller trees that have they're sure are completely covered with these vines. These vines are Japanese honeysuckle. And um, not only can that be a problem um, by growing into the tops of those trees, but what it can do, especially for those younger trees, is change their shape, kind of deform them, impact their ability to grow up into these tall, straight trees, and really smother and strangle them when they're young. Um, now that's not as big as a concern for the kind of more mature trees that might have that thicker bark, but especially for these young saplings that are just growing, um, Japanese honeysuckle can be an issue. And in this photo, you can see it not only kind of growing all over these shrubs, but into the canopies of these trees as well. So that's a little bit about why it's a problem and what it can do in some of these natural areas. Um, but what does it look like? So Japanese honeysuckle has an opposite leaf arrangement. It's a vine. And um, you can see here um, on that vine, you have these leaves that are opposite each other. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting about Japanese honeysuckle is that while most of those leaves most of the time are going to have these smooth margins, um, especially on, uh, I've noticed on some of uh, the lower leaves on that vine, you might actually see lobes occasionally. So here's some kind of lobing that might happen on Japanese honeysuckle, but really most of the time you're going to see it, it's going to look more like this with these smooth margins that don't have any lobes. Now in the winter time, Japanese honeysuckle in our area is kind of semi-evergreen. So in the winter, it might turn this kind of deep purple or reddish color with the leaves still on. Um, some of those leaves might also still be green. Um, so another kind of thing to look for in the winter would be those leaves retained having a deeper color. So again, this time of year, it kind of sticks out because it has these um, beautiful tubular flowers that are fragrant. They start out this kind of creamy white color, and then as they age, they're going to turn more of a yellow color. Those will mature and turn into uh, blackberries, small blackberries on those vines. Um, just a kind of another thing to look for in identification would be the bark of the Japanese honeysuckle, those small vines. They kind of have this shredded bark. And if you were to cut a small stem of it um, kind of open, you would see that it's hollow on the inside. The center of that um, stem is hollow. And you may th be thinking, this sounds kind of familiar. I've seen lots of honeysuckle, but it's more in a shrub form. And there are some lookalikes, the number one of which I'd say is a different invasive honeysuckle. Um, that's bush honeysuckle. So the key distinguishing feature between these two is that bush honeysuckle grows as a shrub, while Japanese honeysuckle is a vine. Um, in addition, the bush honeysuckle has red berries, while the Japanese honeysuckle has those black berries. Um, but, you know, this is just an example of other invasive honeysuckles that have been brought to the United States from Asia through kind of the ornamental trade. Uh, so you can still find um, uh, Japanese honeysuckle sold commercially. Um, but both of these are a problem in your woodland setting, your, your Japanese honeysuckle, the vine honeysuckle, as well as the bush honeysuckle. Um, but I do want to mention we do have a native vine honeysuckle that's a really beautiful plant. Um, and uh, people call that coral honeysuckle. And it's just gorgeous and has these bright pink uh, coral color flowers. Um, and I think it's a fantastic alternative for a uh, landscape setting. It also, though, doesn't have quite as dense of a growth form as the Japanese honeysuckle. So if you see a um, vine honeysuckle that's growing really densely and has white flowers, unfortunately, that's not going to be the coral honeysuckle. That's going to be the invasive Japanese honeysuckle. So where is it right now? 
As you can see from this map, it's pretty much everywhere. There's Japanese honeysuckle all over the place, and it's certainly not helped by the fact that you can still find it sold commercially by um, nurseries and retailers, uh, despite the fact that it's invasive. Um, it is a pretty uh, vine and it can grow very well, but it does not stay put and it will take over. Um, so what do you do if you have it? So if you'd like to get rid of it on your property, there are several different options. Um, you can certainly pull it up by hand, especially if you have a small patch or this is in a more contained area, um, you can just pull it up. And uh, you know, for any management practice with honeysuckle, um, winter can be a good time because Japanese honeysuckle is semi-evergreen. So it will stick out a little bit more in the winter while it retains some of those uh, leaves um, when our natives have lost them. So you can certainly pull it up by hand. Um, you can also cut the vines out of trees. Um, so that can be useful to prevent them from overtopping those trees and impacting that growth long-term. Um, there are also lots of foliar herbicide options out there for Japanese honeysuckle. And um, a really good tip would be to apply those anytime kind of in the winter, that October to April period, as long as we have suitable temperatures, because then the other native plants that you want to keep aren't likely to take up that herbicide because they won't have leaves on. They're going to have lost their leaves for the winter, whereas um, Japanese honeysuckle will have retained it. And just a quick note that in this photo, you see someone spraying not Japanese honeysuckle, but another invasive plant that you can be on the lookout for right now, and that is poison hemlock, um, again with that foliar spray. So you can see they're wearing their um, personal protective equipment and applying that to the leaves. Um, so another option, if this area is mobile, you can prevent Japanese honeysuckle from setting seed by mowing it, but just to note that, that won't kill the underlying root system. So it's going to kind of keep coming back in that case. Um, so you can cut or mow or burn to contain or to prep, but that's probably not going to eradicate that long term. And just kind of one other note, uh, you know, don't buy or use Japanese honeysuckle in your garden. Um, it doesn't stay there and it will move out. So instead, think about some of these great native alternatives like the coral honeysuckle uh, that I mentioned earlier. Not only is it going to look beautiful in your garden, but it's going to kind of promote the health of our natural areas better because it's going to be not something that's going to invade and take over and cause problems down the road. Well, thanks for joining me today and learning a little bit more about Japanese honeysuckle. Um, I hope you get out in your woods and promote their health. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out or check us out online. You know, Billy, I always thought that if you heard, heard the word honeysuckle, then that was a bad thing. So, so I'm glad to know that there's like a native alternative to that. Yeah, it, it's a, it's easy to get confused. And I think people, a lot of times they'll see the pretty flowers and they'll just think mm -hmm. it's all good. And, and right. but unfortunately that's not the case. You know, I think um, one of the best things we can do when we're dealing with these invasive plants, Renee, is to really find them early, right? Mm -hmm. Before they get a chance to spread. It's so much easier to treat a few plants right. than an entire hillside of them. So that's one of the best things we can do as stewards of the land out there is to be on the land, checking it out and being attuned to things that we've not seen before, right? So if you see something that's kind of new or different out there, you let somebody know and find out what you've got before it becomes a problem. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So let's move on to our tree of the week. Yeah, so Laurie, and I guess in spirit with um, Dr. Larson, you know, she's got one that was kind of related to the spongy moth um, as well, the mulberries. So we're going to be looking at the red mulberries. And I'll get that going. All right. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the red mulberry. Red mulberry, Morris rubra, is in the Moraceae family, which is a large family with more than 1,850 species, which are mostly found in warmer regions in the world. There are only two species of Morris or mulberry native to the United States, red mulberry and Texas mulberry. Red mulberry is often confused with the non-native invasive white mulberry. 
It is a deciduous tree that ranges in height from 15 to 70 feet tall and up to 20 inches in diameter. Trees can live up to 125 years. It tends to have a rounded crown with a short trunk. The wood is not commercially important due to its size and lack of abundance, but red mulberry fruit is of value because um, it's eaten by people, birds, and small mammals. Red mulberry is native to the eastern half and to mid the Midwest of the United States, from New York, south to Florida, and west into Texas and Kansas. It grows on a wide variety of sites, including moist, well-drained soils of coves and floodplains, field borders, and pastures, and it tolerates a wide range of soil pH. It grows best in the open, but is often an understory tree and is somewhat shade tolerant. This species attains its largest size in the Ohio River Valley and reaches its highest elevation in the southern Appalachian foothills. Red mulberry can hybridize with the non-native white mulberry throughout its range. Red mulberry is deciduous with alternately arranged simple leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are somewhat circular or oval in shape and highly variable. Some leaves have no lobes and others have numerous lobes. They are typically three to five inches long and have serrated leaf margins. They are green above and the surface is somewhat rough like fine sandpaper and the underside is paler and somewhat fuzzy. Autumn color is yellow to golden yellow. And the leaves of white mulberry, which is the one it's often confused with, tend to be smaller and they have a smooth, shiny surface is the easiest way to tell them apart. This species is usually dioecious, which means there are separate male and female trees, but can occasionally be monoecious with male and female flowers on different branches of the same tree. The male flowers are in hanging catkins that are about one to two inches long, and the smaller female flowers are also in catkins. Both male and female flowers bloom in late spring and are wind pollinated. The fruit resembles a blackberry. It's cylindrical in shape and about one to one and a quarter inches long, and it's composed of multiple droops. Each droop contains a small seed. The fruit starts out greenish white and ripens to dark purple in summer. Fruit sometimes falls near the tree, but is usually consumed before becoming completely mature by fruit-loving animals who then disperse the seeds after they have passed through their digestive tracts. Trees can begin producing fruit at 10 years of age with best fruit production between 30 and 85 years. Trees typically have good seed crops every two to three years. The bark is often orangish in color on young trees, and as the tree ages, the bark darkens to a grayish brown with irregular, long, scaly ridges, and the inner bark is tough and fibrous. The wood is relatively weak with a golden brown to reddish brown heartwood and pale yellowish sapwood. It is similar in, in appearance to Osage orange wood. It is ring porous with large early wood pores, the wood that's formed in the spring, and small late wood pores, the wood that's formed later in the summer. It is rated as durable to insect resistance and weather properties. Red mulberry is a valuable wildlife tree. Many animals consume its delicious, abundant fruit, including possums, raccoons, squirrels, bluebirds, indigo buntings, gray catbirds, towhees, mockingbirds, and numerous other fruit-loving birds. The twigs and foliage are often browsed by white-tailed deer, and the bark is consumed by beaver. It is also a host plant for the red admiral and the morning cloak butterfly. Red mulberry is seldom harvested for its timber due to its small size and its scattered distribution. It is used for smaller pieces in carving and wood turning or for fence posts and farm implements. It is also better known for its fruit, which is used to make jams, jellies, pies, and beverages. It is also occasionally planted for its fruit and as an ornamental. The national champion red mulberry as of 2021 is in Ashley, Arkansas. It is 305 inches in circumference, 75 feet tall, with a 71-foot crown spread. Currently, there isn't a Kentucky champion listed as of 2021. If you'd like to know more about national champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees, or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Red mulberry is often confused with the invasive and now naturalized white mulberry, which is a native of Asia but was introduced to the U.S. during colonial times to try to establish the silkworm industry here. 
The leaves of the white mulberry are the primary food source for the silkworm, whose cocoon is used to produce silk. Raising silkworms is very involved, and the worms are very sensitive to changes in temperature and humidity, which made sericultural challenging and expensive, thus limiting silk production in the United States. Now for a few fun facts about red mulberry. In 1607, early English colonists mentioned red mulberry due to the abundance of the delicious fruit. Native Americans, including the Choctaw, wove clothing from the inner bark of the young red mulberry trees, and they also used other parts of the tree to make warming medicines and a remedy for dysentery. It was reported in Arkansas that more than 31 species of birds visited red mulberry trees to eat the fruit. The scientific genus name Morris is from the ancient Greek name Mora, the mulberry tree, and the species name Rubra is from the Latin, which means red, and most likely refers to the fruit. I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or neighborhood, and enjoy the beautiful trees of our state, and maybe get to sample some of the red mulberry fruit. I was wondering, not having taken ID, um, so having three leaves that are different, does that make it easier or harder to identify? I think it makes it a little bit easier, but it can be challenging. You know, whenever we're looking at tree identification, we always encourage folks to look at more than one leaf, right? Um, sometimes you might just grab a leaf and it may or may not be representative of that species. Um, but with the mulberry trees, um, you really need to look at a few different leaves. We have another tree that kind of does that as well, sassafras it'll have multiple leaf types. So um, to me, I think it does aid in the identification of that species. Okay. I was just wondering, I thought, well, maybe three might help, but then it's <laughs> harder. So it's like, no. which one is it? So. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. You got to look at several when you're doing that. So mm -hmm. really cool. Thanks, Laurie, for doing those. Appreciate those. Laurie's actually down at the Kentucky Forest Leadership Program this week um, with 31 high school students learning all about our woodlands and wildlife and insects here in Kentucky. So um, good luck to Laurie and the whole team down there. So yes. So we do have one more video from Dr. Crocker. She is talking about um, honeysuckle leaf blight. Yeah, another citizen science project um, that she's looking for some help with, I believe. So let's get it going. All right. Hi, I'm Ellen Crocker and I need your help. I have a new citizen science project and I'm looking for people just like you to report the locations of honeysuckle leaf blight, which is a disease of bush honeysuckle and other honeysuckles. I'm interested in this disease because I'd like to have better ways to control invasive bush honeysuckle and Japanese honeysuckle, which is the vine species of invasive honeysuckle that we have in our area. And while this disease right now isn't causing a ton of damage, in some areas, it seems to be associated with a decline over time of these honeysuckle. So I want to learn where is the disease, um, just how much disease does it cause, and is there any way we could weaponize this disease as a biological control for these invasive species? So if you're not familiar with bush honeysuckle, it's an invasive shrub that can grow almost like a tree, like a small tree, but more often you'll see it in your forest understories, along the sides of roads, even people's backyards. Yards. It was really popular as an ornamental plant. Um, it was used for erosion control and other things, but it doesn't stay put. So even though it might start there, birds will eat those berries and move them to other locations. So while you might have a honeysuckle in your yard and you've had it for years and it hasn't really spread, um, those berries are still being carried by birds and being uh, kind of scattered throughout forests and old field sites and really taking those over, forming this dense layer that a lot of native plants can't really compete with. It's gonna shade them out and produce such a dense dense layer that nothing else is going to be there. And so that's why bush honeysuckle is a problem, because it decreases the, the diversity of those areas and it reduces the regeneration of the native species we want to be seeing. So what does honeysuckle leaf blight look like? You can see that little patches of dead tissue, maybe some leaf distortion and curling in. Um, you can see other leaf problems, but I think this really stands out and there's a lot of it. We don't have any shortage of it. Um, 
um, in the central Kentucky area. But what I really would like you to do is if you see bush honeysuckle with these symptoms, I want you to get out your smartphone and the app iNaturalist and report that um, as honeysuckle leaf blight on iNaturalist. We've got a project going and you can join that project to get updates on what we're doing. You can also see where else in the world are people finding honeysuckle leaf blight. So if you see any symptoms that look like these, please submit them on the app iNaturalist and that way I'll be able to see them and kind of get an idea of where it is and what kind of damage it's causing. So a big thanks to all of you for watching today and I hope that you will get out there in the next few weeks as we start to see some of these symptoms and report them to me. Let me know what you're seeing and kind of help advance our fight against bush honeysuckle and other invasive plants. I had no idea that bush honeysuckle could get that massive. Oh my goodness, that that one picture, it was huge. It looked like a big tree that was hundreds of years old. I know, and it, it's really kind of a scary plant in a lot of ways. You know, if you look at our woodlands here in Kentucky, especially in central Kentucky, most of the understory, Renee, is bush honeysuckle, honeysuckle. Right? So, you know, if we can help Dr. Crocker and other researchers get a better handle on um, ways that we can control and deal with this species, it's good. So I encourage you all to please um, participate in that project and um, you can help out and help make our woodlands healthier and safer here in Kentucky for sure. And that's the main thing, right? Just to do that and try to, to keep them for uh, years to come. No doubt, you know, and I mean, we all have a role to play. And um, so please find a way to contribute to help and make our woodlands as good as they can be. Right. And so if you uh, missed anything today that you're like, oh, I really need to get back and try to figure out what that was, you can watch uh, From the Woods Today doc on fromthewoodstoday.com. You can watch any episode that we've had. Over 100 are on there. I mean, you could binge watch us for days <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you yeah. wanted to. No doubt. Lots to learn. And, you know, it, it, we really appreciate all of our guests that come on and share um, this great content and our whole forestry and natural resource extension team and our resident entomologist, Dr. Exactly. <laughs> we greatly appreciate it. And you know, um, so we're pretty much out of time for today. Thank you for watching and we will see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Take yeah. care. Bye everyone. From the woods today.